minutes of the meeting of 789-90 held November 13, 1989. Has everyone received a copy and what is your wishes? Mr. Chairman, I move that we accept the minutes. Second. Been moved and seconded. Everyone understand the question? All in favor? Raise your hand. It's a vote, seven to nothing. Citizen discussion of items not on the agenda. If anybody here has got an item that isn't on the agenda they'd like to throw out, you're welcome to do so at this point. If not, we will move on to reports and correspondence. And we have Robin Harmon, Greater Port Council of Government. Is he present? Yeah, I believe he has a few words. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Robert Harmon, and I'm a <coughs> counselor with the uh, town of Standish, and also I am one of the officers for the Greater Portland Council of Governments. And this is our uh, 20th year uh, a celebration in the formation of, uh, of COG. And uh, the reason you have myself, because I am not the president of the Council of Governments, because Jane Emro is the president, and I'm just one of the other officers. So. We're fortunate to have Jane come to us at uh, the town of Standish last week. And uh, Jane spent about an hour and a half in a workshop type setting uh, compared to mine. So what I, what I really like to do, let me continue. Or Where's your gavel, Mr. Chairman? You don't need a gavel. I Oh, you need to hold your hand up. I guess it, okay, go ahead, continue. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Well, just, to, just in terms of uh, really the, the whole purpose that we as the officers and, and the uh, Council of Governments would like to do is just to try to do an outreach under uh, Jane's direction this year and try to get around to all the various member towns that we have, of which there are 22, and and try to uh, present our, uh, our thoughts and ideas of uh, what we would like to do for the future as we look forward to really our third decade of, uh, of uh, involvement. Really, I think if I can break the, uh, the Council of Governments down into three areas, uh, the first one being what we try to do is in the area of forums and also identifying emergency issues for, uh, for our various constituents and the people that we represent. In the area of the whole forums, I think growth management is an area that we try to uh, stay well focused on, uh, as well as putting forth various training programs for uh, municipal officials uh, with the government, and we would like to continue with that aspect of it. The other one we try to do is in the wor uh, area of advocacy, uh, where we try to stay maintain focus with the legislative process. This is not a lobbying effort, but it's more trying to keep our legislative delegations informed of issues that we think, as a planning region, they ought to be uh, quite prepared to, uh, to understand from our perspective. The property tax relief clearly is a focus that we try to work with. Uh, we try to get involved with the areas and the environmental <coughs> aspects as it affects the also, on uh, this Wednesday evening, uh, starting at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, we are holding our annual legislative dinner where we bring our uh, Cumberland County delegation together to comment and try to work together as to what our total agenda ought to be as it relates to the legislature. The other important area I think that we, uh, we try to do for the uh, people uh, with, that uh, we provide services for is joint services. I think the majority of our uh, our towns and cities that are members of CAR clearly realize the savings in joint services that they end up paying in, uh, in dues. And it's a very important aspect. I think it's one of the initial formations of why COG was uh, conceptualized. And I have with me tonight is John Davinsky, who does head up the Joint Services Division of COG and uh, can answer any questions on that that uh, you may have. I think thirdly is the, uh, the land use planning and research. Uh, we pro try to provide the technical assistance. Uh, we try to help towns fulfill uh, their particular goals as it relates to the 1988 growth management law. And also we're trying to get involved with a whole regional plan initiative that we as a, as a whole region need to come up with in order to uh, get in compliance with the, uh, with the uh, growth management aspect to it. We're trying to do that really. It looks like it's going to be about an 18-month process. We're trying to do it via grassroots, trying to build up 
uh, through this whole process as to what we ought to have as a regional plan encompassing all of the various towns within Cumberland County. I think in terms of the executive committee of which uh, uh, Jane presides over, uh, we try to meet at least uh, once a month. Uh, we do have various uh, other committees uh, that also report to it. Uh, we try to meet anywhere from about a, a couple hours, uh, usually in the evening. And the real benefit, I think, is the sharing and bringing forth the common ideas as we try to uh, improve upon this, uh, this region that we're so actively involved with. I think in closing, what I would just like to say, I think we're looking for input and involvement from all of our members. Uh, it's crucial that we, uh, we stay in, uh, in a level of communication and contact so that we can uh, basically provide a much better uh, uh, region and environment for the, uh, for the constituents that we have. So, uh, with that, I, I do hope everyone, I would like to remind again on that 13th, this Wednesday, of the legislative dinner, and as many as uh, can come, I'd appreciate that. So. I'll uh, be open for questions, or John would be glad to take any questions at all on COG or any uh, various services that, uh, that are provided. Thank you. Does anyone on the council care to ask a question, comment? Thank you, Mr. Okay. Hyman. Thank Appreciate you, very you much coming for in. Me. And uh, we have uh, the boss on our council here, you so do. we have a direct in house <laughs> chain of command. You do. Thank I don't you. think you should let Bob off that easy, though. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to uh, eight different communities now, and there hasn't been one community that didn't ask a question. Now, come on, Cape Elizabeth. You have to at least ask one question. Well, Jane. <laughs> <laughs> Make up your own. <laughs> yes, Council Masterson. Um, I know you don't want me to ask a question, really, because of the length of our agenda, but I I'll bow to Jane. Uh, Bob, what are the plans for the next 10 years? Anything new on the horizon? I think the, uh, the real workload uh, that we have in front of us is to trying to come with some reconcilement of the Augusta environmental issues and the, the confusion and the slow up as it relates to the whole interaction with, uh, with Augusta. And clearly, short horizon, two years, uh, continuation of the formulation of our uh, growth management for the region and uh, also some tax reform. Uh, overall, big picture, 10 years, a lot of it just takes the development as it go along. We try to stay a little bit and focus on that. Anybody else? Councilor Tory. I was just going to say, do you still see a focus on property tax relief from COG as being a, another issue as we head into 1990 now that that's, we're going to still keep the pressure on Augusta regarding this issue? Our uh, legislative advocacy committee specifically uh, identified this year as continuation of property tax relief as one of the big priorities. I think there was a little bit of disappointment with what came out of Augusta in the last round that it really didn't go far <laughs> enough. I think uh, what we've seen in a lot of areas that it just takes a lot of continuation and continual momentum to keep pushing. Clearly, uh, COG is going to continue to advocate that. That is going to be one of the discussions, by the way, at, uh, on the Wednesday uh, legislative dinner. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Okay. Anybody else? Thank Thanks you again. Much. We appreciate you coming. Any other reports, correspondence? Any other member of the council have a report they'd like to give? Or any correspondence they would like to read? Councilor Creamer. Yes, I just wanted to uh, make a short uh, mention here of uh, two uh, of the Telegram All-State soccer teams that were announced uh, since we met last on the 19th of November. Uh, four young men and four young women from our community were named to these teams. Um, they include Cormac Kilgallen, Ryan Dahl, David Manthorn, David Goodwin, uh, Wegg Libby, Jody Lewis, Mimi Lossier, and Sharon McBride. So congratulations to these uh, eight uh, young men and women from our high school. Thank you. Anybody else? Not. We'll move on to a public hearing for the Paputic Club for a full-time spiritus, vinous, and malt liquor license and a special amusement permit. Anybody here from the club? Care to speak? It's a public hearing. Anybody have any comments one way or the other? If, if not, we'll close the public hearing and move on to item 76.
to consider approving a full-time spiritus, finest, and malt liquor license, special amusement permit, and take any necessary action. What is your wishes? I move approval. I'll second. second. Been moved and seconded. All those in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed, it's a vote, seven to nothing. Next on the agenda is a public hearing, <coughs> donation of Cape Elizabeth Land Trust. And uh, I believe Mr. Clifford is here. Does he have a few words he would like to say to kick it off and then we'll open it up to the public. My name is Nat Clifford, <coughs> president of the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust. <coughs> Presently, we have under option five acres of land on the shore of Great Pond uh, approximately in the southeasterly side. The town for several years has held pedestrian easements running from Fowler Road and Bowery Beach Road which terminated this land parcel. By uh, the land trust purchasing this parcel and dedicating it as town open space for pedestrian access, we would then be closing those two uh, uh, pedestrian access points from the two roads thereby creating a trail system from Fowler Road to Bowery Beach Road. Other attributes of the property are that it provides a legal and practical access to Great Pond, which uh, jointly do not exist at present. Also, it represents a very attractive piece of land on a high bluff overlooking the pond and uh, in a mature set of woods. The option price for the land is $150,000, against an appraised value of 165000 At the time of our last appearance before the council a month ago, we had raised approximately $43,000 towards this acquisition. I'm happy to uh, uh, tell you now that since that time, our uh, donations and pledges have increased, and we have on hand a total of $50,892.71. That includes accrued interest. Um, what we're before you tonight for is to request that the council authorize the expenditure of $50,000 against the land purchase from the town's land acquisition fund. Not only would this provide us with virtually a third of the money which we need to purchase the land, but it also would create a strong incentive for those final donors of the last $50,000 since every dollar donated would amount to two uh, should the town uh, agree to fund this purchase. That's all I have at the moment. If uh, the council has any questions or through the chair any of the uh, members of the public do, I'd be happy to answer them. Does anybody from the public have a question or a comment they would like to make? If not, we'll close the public part of it and move on to the council. Does anybody from the council have a comment? Anybody? Can I make a motion? Yes, Councilor Cogashaw. Uh, just a couple of, of questions that were enclosed on the conservation easement. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> they were sent to us by Mr. Barnes. And one of them is just, I just sort of wondered why the grantor, meaning the trust, mm -hmm. would want to be able to construct um, and maintain lean-tos if you want to keep this as an open natural area. We're looking immediately at the use of the uh, uh, parcel primarily being to close the access, uh, pedestrian access through. I think in the future uh, the parcel of land, because of its other attributes, uh, will represent a destination point, uh, one that would be useful for picnicking and that kind of thing, um, where structures certainly are not desirable in this type of thing. I think uh, if lean-tos or perhaps even signs can be construed as structures, I, I uh, believe that's something that we should seriously consider. Anybody else? <clears throat> Councilor Amro. Uh, Matt, the last time that you were here, we talked a bit about if the land trust should be dissolved, uh, about the property, uh, the possibility of the property coming back to the town of Cape Elizabeth with all the stipulations that would presently uh, exist mm -hmm. uh, being part of that uh, arrangement. <clears throat> and the proposal the way it is now would, would exclude that possibility. Do you want to comment on 
because you said you thought that that might be able to be worked out. Yes, both our charter and the terms of our option with the owners of the property uh, direct that if the land trust should go out of business, that all our holdings go into a similar or go to a similar land conservation organization. And a state statute is mentioned in, in, again, both the option agreement and our charter. And the state statute deliberately excludes uh, municipal and, and governmental bodies. So this would be something that, that uh, um, under both the option agreement and our charter, we just wouldn't have the legal right to do. Okay. Anybody else? Council Creamer. <clears throat> also, uh, with the current draft, my understanding is that uh, the land trust and Mrs. Jordan would be basically the, the, the two entities to agree um, uh, to possible changes in the future without uh, town approval. Uh, and there was some concern about the need to amend uh, this draft to uh, require that uh, any changes would have to be approved by the town council. Can can you comment on that? Mm. What I would hope is that the council would see fit to authorize uh, the funds based on our coming up with a satisfactory option agreement. Uh, I believe that section does need some work. I agree with you on that. And uh, I think that's something that can very easily be done. There are two ways of doing it, frankly. One is to make it a three-way agreement, and I believe that may be unduly cumbersome. I think maybe just striking that entire section would make more sense. So a, a possible um, affirmative vote this evening to authorize the $50,000 uh, could be done pending this language being cleared up mm -hmm. to the satisfaction of our town attorney and the uh, town council. Most definitely. Okay. Council Cogeshall. Yes, I have another question on the agreement, um, subsection 6, in reference to baseline data. Mm -hmm. You talk about... Um, the holder, meaning the town? Mm hmm that's correct. Um, shall promptly prepare an inventory of the property's relevant features and conditions, which would be um, termed the baseline data. Now, you expect the town, through its conservation commission or various um, professional people, to do this work? That's correct. This uh, uh, clause exists in most of the easements and, and uh, open space ownerships that the town has, and uh, including the most recent uh, one that we conveyed to the town, which was on uh, runaway farms. Yep. How expensive a proposition is this? We, um, as a strictly volunteer organization, I, I certainly think so, and I think uh, uh, this is something that the town should be doing through the Conservation Commission on its holdings, mm -hmm. as well as the land trust uh, on, on land and easements that we own. Okay. okay. Anybody else? Councilor Matheson. <clears throat> um, Nat, did I understand you to say that you thought the least cumbersome way of dealing with the problem that's been brought up about approvals, changes, waivers, et cetera, in this agreement. Do I understand you to say that you'd be willing to strike that all out? Personally, I would be, and I think I'd make that recommendation to my board. Uh, but, but if you did that, Nat, then you wouldn't have any vehicle at all to make changes or waivers. For the benefit of the council and anybody concerned about that issue, uh, any waivers or, or amendments have to consider the restrictions in the easement. In other words, we cannot alter or violate any of those restrictions. So there's a fairly narrow area that we're working within in terms of, of amendments. And a lot of easements do not have that clause. What clause? The, the clause to, to be able to amend. Well. Does, does your group have any, any uh, problems with having the council approve changes that you might suggest in the future, you and, and Again, Mrs. Jordan? Speaking personally, uh, if, we, if the council were named, then the land trust and the current owner of the property, I think, probably should be too. 
and I see it as being cumbersome perhaps some years down the road to go back to the, the uh, owner or the heirs of that property. And um, I'm just not sure legally whether, whether we'd be able to drop them out completely and have it a matter between the council and the, and the land trust. Okay. Council? Well, uh, I've got my question answered, but it doesn't help my thinking. Council Greenlaw. Um, okay. Going back to Phyllis's question on section number six, the baseline data, where you have the holder preparing the inventory, is that something that is ever done with the holder preparing the inventory and it being reviewed by the grantor? I wouldn't think there'd be anything terribly unusual in that. Uh, Peter, is that something you've run? If questions on the baseline data where the holder, meaning the town, shall promptly prepare an inventory of the property's relevant features and conditions to be called the baseline data. My question, Peter, is, is this ever done with the holder doing that inventory and the inventory then being reviewed by the grantor? It seems to me it would be beneficial for there to be agreement, initial agreement between the two parties on what the relevant features and conditions are, rather than have any disagreement down the road. Okay. That's something I'd like to have included when this is, I'm assuming there will be some minor <laughs> redrafts. When we spoke with you last month, Nat, we, I think there was some discussion about mountain bikes mm -hmm. being allowed, and the way I'm reading it right now is that mountain bikes would not be allowed. Is that correct? That is our attempt in this first draft. That's mm -hmm. correct. Okay. Yep. Very good. I also shared um, Councilor Kogashal's question, I guess, about the lean-tos or rustic shelters. And I guess in looking at something we have coming before us later on this evening, the wet proposed wetlands ordinance, I'm not sure any of that kind <coughs> of work would be permitted. Mm -hmm. So just so that's you know, said for on the record at this point. A substantial amount of this property is in the resource protection zone, so that, mm -hmm. that perhaps if a wetlands ordinance reference that zone, then that would, of course, control. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Councilor Tory. Yeah, just to go back to Section 10 again for my own clarification. In the event of a dissolution of the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust, that most unhappy occurrence, should that happen, and it was transferred over to another like organization, would that organization have the ability to sell the land. I guess we would still keep our easement, meaning that citizens could still use it for, for walking, et cetera. But would it be possible for that organization to sell it, do some building on it, et cetera, but just keep paths where people could, could be walking on? In other words, mm. th this would be a major problem to me. You know? yeah. and God forbid in, in the instance where suddenly there's some financial problems with your organization, another organization gets it 10 years down the road, they're under a major crunch and say, we've got to sell this out. There's building going on there. And all we have left is a token path to get down. You know, I, I still, I don't see, the major issue last time that we left you with was the protection of us giving sizable taxpayer dollars and what happens down the road. Now, I guess, is your answer this time that it was, you've, you've researched and it's a state law that we, that the town can't be involved? Or what, Simply the what way our charter is set up and the terms of our option agreement with the uh, property owner. Uh, to me, and I think this would be borne out by an attorney, the, the strongest and controlling document in, in this whole process would be the easement that the town would hold. That governs the use of the property, what can and cannot go on there. Um, the land trust is perfectly free to sell the property uh, after we take title to it, not that we would have any intention of doing it, but there's no encumbrance to doing that. Mm -hmm. And that was why in the case of the uh, runaway farms, situation, we were so quick to want to give the town an easement because the land came to us free and clear and had no encumbrance. And we couldn't give ourselves the easement, so it, was, it, it just made sense to get an easement on the land that dictated the terms of the use of that land. Mm -hmm. And in this case, the same thing applies. Uh, we have, in this case, uh, very strict deed restrictions, and those will apply to anyone owning the land. But beyond that, the easement is, is the document which also controls the, the uh, do's and don'ts in the use of the And, and what, are, what are some of the don'ts then that would be involved? Don'ts are, are motorized vehicles, fires, cutting timber, 
building, mm -hmm. and anything that would, would uh, hopefully we've covered anything that would, would smack uh, as a use adverse to uh, uh, public access and, and open space and, and uh, enjoyment of the property for hiking. So, so the way the easement's skating. worded, if you, know, you went into dissolution, another group got it and decided to sell it, houses couldn't spring up there because no, an easement no. says no building. <laughs> No, that not only the easement, but you see the deed that, that we will receive from the current owner will also have the restrictions, so there's a double uh, uh, safety measure there. But certainly the easement will control it. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Council Masterson? Uh, the, <coughs> the easement does not include <coughs> the acreage. The amount the whole, of acreage? Yeah. Uh -huh. Does it? It includes all of the amount of land that you are going to buy? It certainly is intended to, that's right. Okay, it, is, it isn't just a path <coughs> oh, no. connecting no. the two other The houses. easement is, is over the entire <coughs> five acres or whatever it amounts to to be acquired. Understand that this uh, op, uh, the uh, easement agreement has not been reviewed by our board. We, we put it together fairly quickly to get something back to you to show basically uh, uh, what we are prepared to uh, execute with the town. Thank you. Councilor Greenlaw. Nat, refresh my memory, please. I'd like to know, I'd like more information about the land trust membership and the contributors so far for this cause. I'd like, you know, can you give me a number of members that you have in the land trust? And if any of those live outside of Cape Elizabeth, I'd be interested in knowing that. Mm -hmm. And how many people or firms, different contributions you have had to date for this. I think part of the question stems from the fact that it is a public hearing. I see a lot of people in the audience whom I personally can identify as belonging to the land trust. I haven't had a phone calls about this except from land trust members. We're talking about committing a fairly substantial amount of money from the town to this, and I don't hear anybody in the public speaking up, so I'm trying to get a feel for them probably speaking through you. Mm -hmm. We, going back over our records uh, uh, since we've been in existence, we have uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 350 to 400 people who have sometime over that three-year period been members of the land trust and donated. Um, our current membership is probably in the 280 to 290 uh, jumping between households and individuals. We put a mailing out uh, quickly after our last uh, appearance before the council uh, telling the membership what we were up to so that people would be prepared for this public hearing. Immediately following that, we began receiving uh, uh, donations and pledges from the membership, uh, which gives me and our board a sense of the uh, uh, support that's out there for this project. Um, I would say at the moment, um, we've probably heard from 30 to 40 people and have taken in uh, almost $7,000 just from that mailing, in addition to uh, uh, direct solicitation. Um, most of the membership is local, and we have a few who have either moved away since they first joined or people who are here in the summertime and, and I can think of names that appear on the list that are, that are out of the area, but, but not too many. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Do I hear? I have a couple comments and we'll entertain them. Do you have, I notice in the agreement there there's no dimensions of how far from the Great Pond or how wide or how deep and what have you. And I noticed at the map at the last meeting it, to me by the size of it they come pretty handy to the back of their houses there now do you have an agreement with the owner or how far it's going to come there's going to be a fence there and everything is that going to be in within the deed mm -hmm. the, the there will be in the deed yeah the meets and bounds of the property are very clearly spelled out in the option agreement and the the parcel that we're purchasing is approximately square and uh, comprises as I said five acres runs back into the the uh, fields and there is a restriction, a deed restriction, which would be in the option that farming has to be uh, uh, allowed to continue as long as anybody's interested in doing that. There will be a fence uh, which will also not only protect the farming but, but the uh, property owner. Uh, there's quite a depth to that field and we are 
If you're familiar where the pond is in the field, our ownership will go below that pond. So there's a fair distance from there back. It'll go the below, below the pond. That's correct. Yeah, yeah I understand that. But, uh, but there'll be no other, I didn't kind of understand the description the way I pictured the place anyway, but if you say it's there, it's there. But I understand where the line's gonna be and I hope they do. The other thing is a newspaper article is in the paper and I had a couple of people mention it to me. Are they going to be able to go down through her land to get to this parcel? And I think that should be straightened out mm. no. through someone or somehow or some way. Yeah. Because I think that's the impression that people, some people have gotten in just reading the article is in the paper. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess I understand with the agreement now that I didn't before is that Regardless who owns it in the future, it's always going to be an open space parcel, exactly. regardless whether you own it, another trust own it, or another conservation group own it. It'll always be that way. Exactly. Okay. Councilor Cogshaw. I just wanted to ask, um, how much of this five acres is currently cultivated? I'd guess probably... Uh, Two, two and a half acres? So about half? I'd say less than half, yeah. Anybody uh, that's walked the land have any? Uh, no, not that much. No. Uh, half an acre. Mm -hmm. You heard it from a neighbor. Mm -hmm. Gee, all the hands are coming. Uh, the ladies first, Council this. Matheson. I'm trying to move this to a <coughs> conclusion. Thank you. Um, Nat, did you really expect us, you, you say you put this agreement together rather hurriedly, it's a first draft, you really don't expect us to uh, allocate the $50,000 until we've seen the final draft, and that perhaps you've had an opportunity to respond to my concern about town approval down the road. and. Phyllis's concerns and some of the other concerns that you've had tonight? I would hope that you would see fit to allocate the money based on our presenting you with a with an acceptable easement. I have no doubt that that can be done, which is uh, why I'd like to uh, make that request of you. Councilor Tory. In light of that, uh, I, I do believe there's still wording to be worked out, as you've indicated, and, and I see, you know, positive head nods all around, so I'm sure we can get to it. So I'd like to make the motion and to consider allocating 50000 from the Land Acquisition Fund to the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust for the acquisition of the land adjacent to Great Pond. Second. Would you want to uh, add to that Ending. after yeah. receiving the yeah. document S satisfactory to the manager or to the council? Exactly. Do you agree with the second? Anybody else have any comment? I yes. just I had a question of clarification. I think your motion said to consider allocating. Yes. To, to allocate. To allocate. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I, I just wanted to make one other comment in, in summation that I think this is a good type of a partnership that we're working together on. And I just returned from a National League of Cities convention with different councils across the country, and it was called progress through cooperation and partnerships. And, and to come back and be able to immediately vote upon something where partnerships like this are involved is, is very crucial. I don't think we can go it alone, and I don't think you people can go it alone, but working together, we can finally start to put some teeth into the, the action of preserving some of the open space. So I'm glad to see this type of partnership develop between us finally. So, we'll, yes, Councilor Amaral. <coughs> yeah, I just, uh, I feel a little uncomfortable voting $50,000 prior to uh, seeing what the final document's gonna look like. Uh, I would wanna make sure First of all, that this easement is going to cover all of the deeded land. I mean, that somehow that's got to be uh, explicitly uh, written into the, the document. Uh, we need new language for Section 9 or the elimination of that section. Uh, and then there are, for me, those, those two issues are really important. And I think if anybody else has any other issues, I would want to make sure that those uh, my vote would be contingent upon uh, language, acceptable language being worked out on those two items. Anyway. 
Or does anybody else want to add any specifics that they would like to uh, include? As Did part you of include that? my concern? Yours was about the section uh, nine. about section nine. Yeah. 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 <coughs> I guess I'd like to see that specifically ad ad added as an amendment to the motion. But you agree with him? I, I, I just am very concerned about allocating $50,000 when we don't have the final language in front of us. It's not that I don't approve of the whole idea, I do, but I think we're putting ourselves in a difficult uh, situation by taking this vote. Okay. Council Greenlaw. Let me ask Matt a question. When does your option expire? June 20th. I've somehow been under the impression it was before that. No, we have a, uh, a okay. checkpoint at a six month uh, time, which is December 20th. And okay. for our own okay. fundraising purposes, it, it certainly would be a tremendous incentive to be able to uh, say that the council has voted even conditionally on the uh, 50,000. And of course, we've got to get to 100,000 basically for the for the uh, uh, amount also to uh, okay use. what I'm trying to think if it would do I'm hearing concerns and I think very valid concerns from counselors about the conditional situation I'm wondering if any of those would be allayed if we said that the 50,000 would not be committed until there was closing on the property it from our standpoint, wouldn't be possible to set up a closing unless we knew we had the yeah. commitment. Uh, I, it's a nice catch-22. I guess this is a case of, of concerns of people on different sides of the fence. Uh, from my standpoint, I am that confident, and, and I think the directors I've spoken to are, that we can come up with an option acceptable to the town that if the uh, authorization for uh, the expenditure of the funds was conditional simply on our presenting you with an easement acceptable to the town, town attorney or whoever. Uh, that certainly gives you every protection and puts more or less the burden on us to, to work out an easement that, that is acceptable. I hear your concerns and I, I don't see that there's anything that's going to be difficult to overcome. It's just a matter of time. And time is important to us, of course, just to keep the fundraising going now that we made a public announcement. Of the, the I think I. I'll reiterate, I share the concerns. I've worked, I tend to work with a lot of conditions and approvals, and I perhaps don't share the concerns as, as deep-seatedly as some of the other counselors, but I can certainly understand their hesitation and, you know, would not be surprised if there's another motion. Councilor Kramer. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly have a sense that the general uh, consensus of the, the council is very much pro uh, authorizing this expenditure. However, there are at least five or six, you know, hefty uh, areas that need rewriting, basically, in the draft before I think we can, uh, in conscience, uh, you know, bestow this amount of money uh, to the land trust. Um, you know, I guess what I'm hearing is that you're asking us to do that uh, really for the purposes of fundraising at this particular council meeting. The timing does uh, uh, come down to that, yes. That's correct. But can I just want to... Oh. Council Cargoshaw. No, he had his hand up first. Oh, I'm sorry. I just, I, just, I just wanted to clarify from my point of view again to try to, as Nancy said, bring things to a little head here. I don't think there's five or six hefty areas that need to be rewritten. If, there were, if I did, I wouldn't be voting in favor of it. I think there's one area that we're... In terms of the easement covering the entire land, I think that's clear. We're taking your word on it. It's covering the entire piece of land. It's, it, there, cannot, there won't be building in the future anywhere on the land. The second sticking point is that the land trust and Mrs. Jordan could agree to have some changes in the future without the town being involved. You're willing to renegotiate that to make that so that we can either become a part of that. Do you understand why that's unsavory to the town's point of view? And you're willing to renegotiate that. You feel that's within your jurisdiction. Those are the two what you might call sticking points, one of which is even a non-existent sticking point that I think we can get beyond right now. 
given our faith in that and what he's telling us here. He does not say, I think he would say right now, I think that's a major stumbling block. I just don't see how I can go back to the board or go back and recreate that. I, I just can't do it. We've got, if that's going to kill the deal, that'll kill the deal. You're not saying that to us. You're saying that you feel that can be renegotiated. And on that, I'm willing to proceed in order to keep their momentum and our momentum going on this project. Councilor Cargoshaw. I would like to see the motion um, perhaps a little tighter and would want to amend it to um, have our vote tonight conditional upon final legal and town council approval, which means we would have a second chance to vote on the actual language, but in the basic concept as it's being presented, we agree that we would like to spend the money and have this purchased. And we could be more specific and actually list Jane's um, two major concerns that the agreement would have to have the easement in writing cover all of the land, that number nine perhaps be totally eliminated, and that Janet and I had discussed adding in number six that the baseline inventory would also be approved by your group so that we know we're both agreeing on the same features of the land. It is not, it is not my intent to eliminate that language about the flexibility of being able to amend or the, the agreement or waive a certain restrictions, but that the town council ought to approve those, those amendments. That's my intent, not to strike it out. It was Nat who said you could strike it out, but I think it would be very unwise to do that, Nat because you want some flexibility in there. I believe what I said or certainly intended to say is that that could be either stricken or uh, the town could be added to it. I don't see a problem yeah. doing either. Well, I think it's adding the town to it that, that I would like yeah. to say. That's I, my concern. I just want to ask you a question, if I may interrupt with people here. It seems like we're plowing the same ground over and over here. How much of a problem it is to have, a, have it on the agenda in the next meeting? and have this work done. Now, some of these questions that we asked for at our last meeting that really didn't get cleared up in my mind and I think other people's minds. So to have it all cleared up and we have it on January. Considering, Mr. Chairman, the uh, uh, intervening holidays and, and knowing uh, the timing of simply getting something drafted and running it by the town manager, taking it back to my board and bringing it back to the council, I can see uh, needing probably more time than that for the option and I think it probably would pay to take the time because I, I have a sense too that, that there are differences uh, of opinion on minor issues uh, between the various council members and I think this easement's going to be in place a long time and I think time should be taken to get it right. That's why I, uh, from our standpoint, see it as, as perhaps a more efficient thing if, uh, if you're willing to uh, uh, place a condition on the approval. Um, that the easement be put together in a, in a form acceptable to the town. And I think that would give us time then to, to hash out the various issues and get a, a consensus from both bodies. When, when do you think you would have it completed, just run on it? February, March? I don't want to wait until the target date mm. of June 30, that's all. Uh, no, because I think we're running into problems with our option then. Um, I would think we could come up with, with another draft probably within uh, several weeks. I think by the time it goes through the town and, and uh, back to my board, uh, perhaps a couple of months. So that'd be February? Yeah. You'd yeah. think you could have something back? I, so I would say by then we could probably have something. In other words, given time for back and forth. So if we can come up with a motion here with a commitment that we're going to give you the money at the time of a satisfactory draft, you'd be satisfied with that? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, one of our directors, Penny Carson, had something she wants. Uh, I just wanted to know, Mr. Chairman, if, if I could maybe clear up a few things for Councillor Masterson and a couple of councillors that have concerns. You know, real estate people will tell you that we sign contracts for houses for hundreds of thousands of dollars with little tiny conditions in them. And if those little conditions are not met, the whole thing is over. So to, for you to vote on this item with the condition that the uh, final approval will be at a 
properly worded document sometime to follow is not unusual at all. Because if that document is not properly worded, then the, then the whole thing is null and void to begin with. It must meet that condition. So it's not unusual to have something conditional upon something else. And I hope that you will feel encouraged to vote on that tonight since we have this time problem. Thank you. I'll tell you more. I guess it's, it's, for me it's different operating in the public sector because I think if we vote tonight to authorize $50,000 with conditions to be met, we're setting up an expectation in the community that we're going to uh, appropriate that money. And I think it would be much more difficult uh, not to at some future date. So I, for me, uh, serving in a public position is a little different, and I think we have to be a little bit more careful, or a lot more careful, about allocating uh, such a large amount of money. And I just, I think the process is backwards. Uh, I want to see what it is I'm going to approve before I allocate the funds. And the more we talk about it, uh, the less comf comfortable I feel about uh, voting posit positively on this tonight. So what? I what I would like to suggest, I know we have a motion on the floor, but I'd like to suggest that we take a consensus of feeling of the council on appropriating the money uh, once the conditions that we've talked about have been met, but that we not, uh, in the form of a motion, make a commitment of uh, allocating this fund, depending on some future document that we haven't yet seen. You, you have a uh uh, feelings that uh, we couldn't work out those uh, agreements I think before we pass some money over to them. And I, f I feel comfortable of sitting here that, hey, land trust, the money sitting here, you get the document and to my liking and you'll have the money, but until then it'll sit here. Mr. Chairman, I just is that a fair way I, of I just it? also want to say, in closing for me, this, this is not without precedent. Since the five and a half years I've sat on this council, there have been numerous votes that we've taken through the years where there have been final details to be worked out. I mean, time and again where Tom Leahy and the town manager, et cetera, had to work out some final details. So I don't think this is absolutely without precedent in terms of, of the direction. So to move on, what's Council Greenlaw? One more shot, and I'm cutting it off. Um, I think one advantage of doing this in the public sector is that we have clarified the conditions that we're concerned about. And at this point, I'd like to move the question. Thank you. Would someone like to try to read the motion? I would <laughs> request that of the clerk. We have a move and second to allocate $50,000 from the land acquisition fund to the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust for the acquisition of land adjacent to Great Pond pending a conservation easement that is satisfactory to the town of Cape Elizabeth. I don't think that's agreement. quite an agreement. agreement. Uh, it's not a conservation easement. Agreement, agreement to the town. This is a conservation easement. Yes, I understand that. But uh, <coughs> I think the interpretation I get out of there, then that's a uh, town of Cable is with conservation agreement. And if we wanted to be more specific and add regarding Councilor Amaro's concerns that the town somehow be in the approval process in terms of future changes. I I'd like to also add that to the motion if we could. If, is that necessary to add or not? Or is that included already in your wording? Would that be part of the agreement then? The yes. agreement would be changed. Okay, fine. You don't have to add that. Yes, Councilor. You know, I'd just like to, to, to make one point. I'm, I'm most sympathetic with the issue. Um, I, uh, I think the $50,000 is a uh, a very good uh, investment. I'm not able to vote for this particular motion because I think that it's uh, sort of backwards uh, democracy and I think that we're using a vote uh, to basically raise funds that's conditional uh, upon the future working out. Now this may have been, uh, the precedent may have been set in the past, um, but I just don't think it's a good way to, uh, to work. I, th I think really all we're doing is telling the land trust is $50,000 available once we get an agreement. That's all. That's the way I look at it. I don't have any problems with it otherwise. We're telling them so they can move on to raise other funds. If the town is in here, we've raised so much, it's helping them on their fundraising part of it. 
we haven't got to spend the money. If they can't come up with a satisfactory agreement, we haven't got to give them the money to us, so I don't feel that Move way. Move the question, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Everyone understand the motion? All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed? Four to three. Passes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I like the front row. We have three past chairmen. Council. <laughs> <laughs> Plus Lester in the back. Plus Lester in the back, and with the old time, I'd like to speak. <laughs> Moving on to item 78. Will you guys take a to, cons on pass? to consider <laughs> establishing a Fort Williams Trust Park Trust Fund, taking necessary action. I believe we have a gentleman here that is for this. Park Fund, Mr. Blood. My name is Clint Blood and I'm Chairman of the Fort Williams Commission. And it certainly is a pleasure to be before you not discussing the Keeper's Quarters for the first time since I've become Chairman. <laughs> um, this past spring, with the death of Art Hahn, as well as uh, two of our commissioners, fellow commissioners, have had inquiries about leaving money uh, to the fort, it became evident that we did not have a vehicle to facilitate donations and bequests to the Fort Williams Park. And using Mr. Weil as our resource, our newest commissioner, uh, he developed a trust which is patterned after the Spurwing Church, along with working with Mike McGovern, so that we would be able to have a vehicle which people could use to donate money to the fort. We hope that this, the trust would then help maintain the integrity of the park. The purpose of the trust is not to take over the financial responsibilities of the park in terms of maintenance of the park, but rather to take on and do some of the special types of projects uh, that we are now doing with our tax dollars, such as the, the bleachers and the um, bunker. We've got the pond ahead and we've got the band shell, et cetera. So what you have before you, and um, Randall is here in the audience. If he, he can talk to you more about the technical aspects, I'm not an attorney. Uh, but, he can, but the purpose really is to allow people uh, in our community as well as outside our community to come in and be able to donate money to the, to the fort, and we'd have a vehicle which would work with their wills or their estates, et cetera. So I'm happy to answer any questions at this time. Uh, I believe you have a copy of the uh, tr trust document in front of you. Anybody have any questions? Mr. Blood? Huh? Oh, I didn't see it. I have a quick question for the manager. Um, do all the fees that are generated by the Spurwick Church go into a fund, or do they go to the general fund? No, all the donations go into a fund. All the fees go into the general fund. Council Latouri. And again, just to clarify for ourselves and for the people at home, the money that we allocate from as a town council, traditionally 55000 60000 et cetera, none of that goes into the, the trust fund also. That, Correct. That's for general maintenance. Now, will, will you be kind of supplementing, pro, doing supplementary projects with this money? or? Is that we are, we have not, obviously we have no money, so we've yeah. not sat down <laughs> and thought about how we're going to spend it. Uh, but the purpose really would be that if there's small amounts that come in or larger amounts come in that, again, we, we just don't have a vehicle to, yeah. to use right now. So this is really the vehicle. So if someone calls the town and says, I would like to have my, my will uh, to leave some money to the, to the park, we have a vehicle they can use. Mm -hmm. Also, if we have small amounts come in, we can put them together and hopefully do something that would be constructive for the fort. Very good. So in the future, you know, we're looking towards the future. Council Cargishaw. Are you going to... Um well, naturally, if there's a, a, a donation with a specific request, in order to accept it, you would have to execute that request. Um, but would you be setting up priorities for non-designated um, donations? Uh, the answer to that would be, yes, we would have to set those up, but it would be, uh, be recommendations for your approval, since you would be the uh, <coughs> trustees of this trust, the town right. council. And there again. I would, I would like to recommend to the town manager that the town council be um, oriented somehow as, as to trust and our responsibilities as trustees 
of the various trusts and not just as town councillors. If we're going to be the trustees of this trust, and are we also the Spearwink Church? Yes. And we are of the Thomas Jordan Fund. That we need, we need to have some orientation. I don't know if Mr. Wheel will be the one to do it, um, since he wrote this or not. But <laughs> no. <laughs> I probably at an opportune time when the town attorney is present for some other purpose, uh, we might ask not him to. Not just so. No. Okay. Does anybody else have a question? Council agreement. Does the uh, does the keeper's quarters figure in at all, Clint, with this particular trust in, in the sense of uh, whether in the future we own the keeper's quarters or are leasing the keeper's quarters as part and parcel of Fort Williams? We looked upon this, quite honestly, in, in regards to the park, not towards the keeper's quarters. Now, depending upon how that all evolves in terms of the future, and if the keeper's quarters becomes part of the park, then it would fall under the guidelines of this trust because it would be part of the park at that time. If, in fact, you know, it's still separate, so as we do it right now, we're looking at the park itself as definitely not with the emphasis on the keeper's quarters at all. Okay. Anybody else? Councilor Greenlaw. One concern I have, and I think it goes along with what Councilor Cogshaw was mentioning, and when you said if there were funds that were given to you designated for a particular purpose, and my concern arises from the fact that if those funds did not, that purpose did not concur with some of the stated purposes that are right now on the books or that come out of the um, master plan that's going to be in the works, what would happen? How do you deal with a situation like that? Maybe that's something we deal with when we learn how to be good trustees. I'm not sure. But that is a con I wouldn't know what to do at this point. We have discussed that uh, somewhat in our committee. One of the concerns and what we're hoping this will deal with to some degree is that we don't end up with the park being a, a lot of memorials. Yeah. Um, that this could be a vehicle and maybe there might be some type of, you know, putting people's names on a plaque or wherever, but not to have a lot of memorials all around the park. That we keep it in its natural beauty. And this is one of our hope with this. Now, if someone wants to give money for a particular purpose and it doesn't go along with what we feel is a purpose, then we can't accept the funds, obviously. I mean, that's, that's the, what the result is. But the, the goal here was for allow people to donate to the park and perhaps uh, achieve what they're trying to achieve without having memorials with their names all over the park as time rolls along. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if you, it might be advisable to have some kind of wording that would clarify that. Um, that it be within the goals as set forth by the Fort Williams Advisory Committee or as set forth in a, an approved master plan or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. I guess I would like to have people be aware of that situation as much as possible. I, I would hate for anybody to be in an embarrassing position with money being offered that we are not comfortable accepting. But I'm, you know, that's basically the only concern I have at this point. I'm mm -hmm. very glad. I Out of it. I'm very heartened by your work. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Wiles, I see you moved down front. You're tromping at the bit <laughs> to say a few words. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Council Latour. In light of Clint doing a great job, I would move establishment of the Fort Williams Park Trust. Second. second. Been moved and second. Everybody understand the motion? All in favor? Raise your hand. Those opposed? Seven enough. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on. <laughs> Uh, item 79, to consider a report from the Ordinance Committee regarding the proposed wetland ordinance taking necessary action. At the outset of this wetland ordinance article, I just want to say that uh, this isn't an official public hearing, but if anybody's here and would like to have a safe few words after Council Creaming gets done, we'll welcome it. We have two public hearings we're going to set up in the future here. January the 8th and probably the first Monday in February, so you'll have plenty of time to come in and there'll be time enough to say what you wish to say and more to probably. I have a letter I'd like to read here before I turn it over to Council Creeman and it's from the Sprague Cooperation. Dear Mr. Jordan, Draft 18 of the Cableless Wetland Ordinance has just come to my attention. We have not had, at this time, an opportunity to evaluate the impact of the proposed ordinance 
would have on your property, on our property, excuse me. We would like the opportunity to review the proposal and respond with our concerns and our objections should we have them. Could you please notify me at the appropriate time for such a response? Janet Hagan, Sprague Cooperation. So I just wanted to throw this out and I think there's been other concerns here and they can pass it on. And I'll turn it at this time over to Councilor Creeman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. What I have before me this evening um, is a document entitled the Cape Elizabeth Wetlands Ordinance. Uh, this is in draft form. Uh, it's dated December 6, 1989. There are 15 sections to this ordinance. Um, it is a 14-page document that is an expansion of regulation of wetlands alteration, which comes from our zoning regulations, Chapter uh, 19. What I would like to do this evening uh, is to briefly uh, discuss the major sections in this particular draft ordinance uh, with the understanding uh, that this uh, ordinance will be re-referred back to the ordinance committee uh, tomorrow where we can uh, tighten up some of the uh, language such that the uh, first of two public hearings uh, will be held hopefully on January 8th, uh, making the point that uh, the Ordinance Committee does not want uh, this to be considered as a precedent uh, for holding two public hearings on every ordinance change. But uh, because this is uh, such a weighty document, um, an important document, we are uh, making this particular proposal uh, and also uh, suggesting it come back to the Ordinance Committee uh, in an effort to uh, expedite uh, this ordinance as per our last council meeting. Section 1841 is the purpose of this particular uh, ordinance. Uh, and basically, this is set forth uh, as clear as possible. Uh, it is the policy of the town of Cape Elizabeth to ensure that wetlands are protected from detrimental impacts and that wetland alteration activities do not threaten public safety, welfare, or cause nuisances or negatively alter natural wetland ecology. Section 1842 discusses areas where these regulations apply. Uh, these areas include critical wetland zones, wetland protection zones, uh, areas to which this ordinance uh, applies that are located within a resource protection district, and areas otherwise subject to this ordinance are not exempt from its provisions due to the placement of fill material thereon, regardless of when such fill material was deposited. Section 18.4-3 include definitions uh, for a variety of terms that um, basically uh, will have the customary dictionary definition unless a specific different meaning is clearly implied. I won't go through all of the uh, definitions uh, examples are coastal dunes, uh, draining, dredging, growing season, hydric soils. Hydric soils are broken down into three particular types, uh, very poorly drained organic soils, very poorly drained mineral soils, and poorly drained mi mineral soils. Predominantly is defined. Wetlands in particular uh, is defined with four subsections needing to at least satisfy one of the uh, characteristics of wetlands. Wetland buffers are defined. The wetland upland edge is defined as is wetland uh, vegetation. Wetland zones are broken down essentially into two major areas, critical wetland zones and wetland protection zones. There then uh, proceeds on pages four and five of the document, uh, permitted, prohibited, and special permit uses. Uh, use activity and structures are uh, delineated with respect to their placement in either critical wetland zones or wetland protection zones, recognizing either the impossibility of placing these structures there, uh, the possibility or the need for a special permit from the planning board. Uh, this continues to section 18.4-5, special permit procedures, which goes through the specifics for the review uh, process. 
Page 7 involves submission uh, requirements. Again, the specifics of uh, owners of such lands uh, needing apply for special permits uh, by submitting to the town planner uh, or code enforcement administrator uh, the particular numbers of copies of the plans for proposed uh, location or activity. Uh, this area uh, leads to section 18-4-6, including the standards. Um, the planning board shall grant a special permit for designated uh, special permit uses, structures, and activities within wetland zones and wetland buffers upon such reasonable conditions if it makes a positive finding based upon the information presented that the proposed alteration will not, and then we go into a series of uh, areas that will not, uh, for example, uh, pro pose problems related to the support of structures, uh, will not be detrimental to aquifer recharge, and again, this continues on for several uh, subsections.
not going to really be in a position to debate the draft. I think we're going to save that for uh, our first of most probably two public hearings in January. Thank you. Now, if, as he said, and thank you, Council Greenman, very good presentation. As he said, that this isn't really a public hearing, but if anybody out there has got a few words they'd like to say that might, ha might help the Ordinance Committee when they review this again and uh, kind of briefly outline it and at your public hearing in January, we'll welcome all criticism and whatever you have as far as this ordinance. So who would like to kick it off? Come down, state your name, and, and uh, we'll listen in and we'll have a few minutes at this. Good evening. My name is Bob Taylor. I am uh, a principal in Stonegate Associates, which has as its principal business um, developing single-family building lots uh, in Cape Elizabeth amongst other communities. Um, I have this evening provided uh, the town manager with a copy of a review by our attorneys of the proposed ordinance. I'm sure that nobody on the council has had a chance to review this letter since uh, I received it at 5.30 and Mr. McGovern received it at 7.25, but uh, additional copies are available if people would like to review it. I would like to say that, uh, that the ordinance as drafted, I believe, has several problems. Those problems are addressed in the letter. I think that if we wanted to, we could uh, we could talk a lot about where the commas are and what the exact choice of words, but I don't think that's the purpose of this evening. Uh, I would like to hit the high points, and that is, first, that the definition of wetlands uh, proposed within the ordinance is broad and more inclusive than any other wetlands definition currently in use by either the state of Maine or the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Because this definition is so inclusive, I think it will impact a substantial portion of the town of Cape Elizabeth. A review of our projects approved in the last four years indicates that 31 building lots out of 60 would be rendered unbuildable by the ordinance in its present form Nine of those 31 lots already have single-family homes erected on them. Secondly, I think that performance standards, which are specified, are substantially uh, stricter in some areas than those required by the current ordinance or by the state wetlands law, and I would urge that these be looked at again. Thirdly, there is no provision for uh, grandfathering of existing approved projects, even when those projects have been through a thorough and complete wetlands review. Fourthly, there is no provision for accessory uses in the expansion of a non-conforming use. For instance, if one had a single family home that had been rendered non-conforming by the ordinance, one could not add a garage or a tool shed. Fifthly, the Expansion in area of a non-conforming use is limited to 25%. This is less than other standards that are in effect within the town and within state regulation. Sixth, the proposed draft does not repeal the existing wetlands alterations provisions of the zoning ordinance, and it might be appropriate to do so so that there are not two standards in the attendant confusion. Seventh, the restriction of uses within the buffers is, in my opinion, uh, unnecessarily restrictive. I believe that buffers are an appropriate part of wetlands regulation and that uses within those uh, buffers require review and approval by a municipal body. However, I think we've gone just a touch too far. Eighth, there is no provision for a Zoning Board of Appeals review, which is the traditional route for hardship review when zoning and land use ordinances um, create or impose a hardship on, upon a citizen or resident of the town. Ninth, there is a, an aspect to the ordinance which would make it retroactive. 
uh, presumably to any time in history, and you'd have to ask, could the, tape, could the Cape Elizabeth Town Hall parking lot be repaved because there are areas of the parking lot that are created on fill land? Having said all that, I would like to urge the board, the council, to send this ordinance back to the ordinance committee with four suggestions. One, that the Cape Elizabeth wetlands map be augmented to show the extent of the buffer zones and that a calculation be provided to establish just exactly what percentage of the town would become subject to the wetlands ordinance. Secondly, that an analysis of existing uses in the town be made so that we might have some measure of the extent of non-conforming uses that were created by the passage of this ordinance if it were to pass in its proposed form. Finally, that, um, that technical analysis and discussion be presented uh, perhaps by the Planning Board or Conservation Commission uh, as to the reasonableness and justification of the various technical requirements of the ordinance. I thank you for your consideration and your patience. Thank you. Is there anybody else out there who would like to say a few words one way or the other? <laughs>